34. The psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. Let's do it together. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. And now here come the reasons. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. Oh, <coughs> taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And let that be the reason we sing today, that his praise will never leave our lips. Let's stand as we sing the gospel and praise the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the King of the In the darkness, in the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light, and from heaven came the one who was this holy mercy filled your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal, to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation who did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering with a leaf on your side, the witness was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. So the church, 
So the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Not as gospel truth of old shall not heal, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For you to love and serve my Lord, Jesus Christ, who ransomed me. Praise the Father, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Great. Oh. 
take our seats, please. The scriptures tell us it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. To proclaim your loving kindness, your steadfast love in the morning, and your faithfulness at night. I hope you've had some prayers answered lately. We have in our family. I hope you have in, in yours. And we're, our scripture this morning takes us to the story of a couple who had been praying long and waiting long. And I think when they got their answer, as a priest, a Jewish priest, who knew his Old Testament well, I think maybe something like this from Psalm 34 is what he would have sung. <laughs>
Amen. We do need to taste to see that God is so, so good to us. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, we'd like to open up to Luke chapter 1. Talk about the promise-keeping God this morning. Luke chapter 1. We'll start there in verse 5 and read through verse 25 this morning. And once you get there, if you don't mind, we're going to stay in and give reverence to reading God's Word. This dear Dr. Luke is writing to the, the beloved, the church, which is before us. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron, and both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren. They were both well along in years. And once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. When the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. It will be a joy and delight to you, and Many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can this be? I am old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized that he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was complete, he returned home, and after this his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord had done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we open your word, let your servant be the vessel for which we hear this word and believe. We give you all glory and all honor. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We started off last Lord's Day in the book of Luke, getting a little bit of introduction and, and learning it why Luke wrote this down. And I stated to you plainly that it was so that you would know. So that you would know the truth. That you could confront false teaching when it came before you so that you could obey God and you could follow him better so that you would know that he is a faithful God that he keeps his promises and so beloved that you would know his love and respond to it knowing your savior and the reason why he came you see in the grand scheme, scheme of things God wants you to know him we understand that we're all sinners. We all fall short of God's glory. And God does not wish any of his created to perish, but for us to have everlasting life. And the only way to do that is to know him, to believe in him, to believe that Jesus is the Lord. You know, just before the coming of Christ in this day, it was a really dark time in history. They'd not heard from God in over 400 years. There was a corrupt government all around them. They were being oppressed from many angles. And many people were wondering, is God even out there? Does God even care about what we're going through? Not since Malachi had announced the coming of one like Elijah had God spoken to them. 
Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now for us, 400 years may seem like a long time to wait on a promise. But God's timing is perfect. And God keeps his promises. And so just as their spiritual leaders are beginning to weigh them down with all sorts of rules and regulations and, and tradition, and, and they are culturally and politically sinking into a place of darkness, God sends light into the world. Because God is faithful. And God is going to speak to this time and this situation with a little bit of humor and a whole lot of joy. Think about the paragraph that started this off as Luke began to tell us this story that he's now documenting for us. God has been silent for 400 years, and when he finally does speak, he speaks to a man who does not believe him. And so with that, that man is made unable to speak to anyone else. And he's coming to a couple that is well past childbearing years. And the last time that that happened in Scripture was with Abraham and Sarah and the birth of Isaac, also a promised son. And so what Luke is kind, kind of doing here is linking some historical facts together. He is, he is weaving a thread from the Old Testament into the New Testament, and he's bringing us to the place of joy and promise and blessing. And that is exactly what they need at this time in history. And it's exactly what we need at this time in history. Verse 5 tells us, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Luke begins his narrative by introducing us to two people who are dealing with all the chaos that is going on in their day. And they're following the Lord as best as they possibly can. Zechariah is a priest in the line of Levi in the division of Abijah. So Luke is setting some historical context for us here in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. David divided the priests in 24 divisions. Each of those divisions had a time to serve in the temple in Jerusalem. There were special occasions that they got to go there and serve. That is important here because by this time in history, there is well over 20,000 priests serving in the divisions. And so for Zechariah to get chosen to do this particular task was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But as we've already noted, beloved, several times throughout Scripture, nothing happens randomly in God's timing. Scripture says that God lays the steps of men. We also learn from Luke that Zechariah's wife is a descendant in the priestly line as well. And in saying that, what he is implementing, what he's stressing, is that these are very devout Jews. They are carefully obeying the laws of God. And so though they're not sinless, they are morally and ceremonially obeying all the requirements in a time when it would have been very easy for them to be like everybody else and just give in. Just go with the flow. Just compromise a little bit. But they're not doing that. Zechariah's name actually means God remembers. God does remember, doesn't he, beloved? His wife's name means his oath. And so Luke is actually giving me a little bit of a message here, putting them together and saying that God remembers his oath. Because we're starting off with this passage and a promise that was given. When you go back a few books in the Bible, in the book of Malachi, we have that promise that we read. For 400 years, there's been silence. Luke also dates this very well for us in telling us that it was in the time of Herod the Great. Now, Herod was a ruthless, evil tyrant. He was appointed by the Roman Senate in 40 B.C., and he stayed in power until his death in April of 4 B.C. 
And in all those 44 years of history, he ruled as an illegitimate authority in Judea because he was an enemy. Now that means he was a descendant of Esau. That's going to be a very important part that Luke tells us that plays a part in Matthew's gospel when Herod, this king, tries to kill the Christ child when the Magi come. And so Luke describes for us this impossible situation. There's a corrupt government. They haven't heard from God in a long time. And he adds to that in verse 7 that Zechariah and Elizabeth are well past childbearing years. So typically when we read about something like this, it's telling us that God has closed up this womb. God has closed up this womb for a very special purpose. We can go back in the Old Testament and read about Sarah and and God had closed up her womb. And, and there was a promised son there that came. And his name was Isaac. And, and again, that follows that thread. And then we can go on through Scripture. We can find a Hannah. And God had closed up her womb. And she spends time there praying before the altar of the Lord. And, and Samuel has promised to her. And so there's a very special miracle that God wishes to bring into this situation. Because you see, beloved, our God is not limited to the possible if it was just possible that anybody could do this. But no, God is not contained in finite parameters. He speaks into the impossible situations. He's outside of time and space and the limits of normalcy. And in this impossible situation with a once in a lifetime opportunity, God begins to move and point us to the one that will save. Verse 8 says, once when Zachariah's division was on duty, he was serving in the priest before God. He was chosen by the lot. Now, we've talked about the lot before. We just read through the book of Esther, and we saw where the lot was used with Haman to pick a certain day in which then the Jews would, would be liberated. We've talked about the lot when we look, went through the book of Acts when there was the choosing of Matthias. And in those times, we find out that God uses things like that to accomplish His will. And God uses those things in natural history to kind of accomplish His goals. And so when the time for burning incense came, and all the assembled worshipers were outside praying, the angel of the Lord appeared to Zacharias standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And so this was the day. This was the day that Zechariah had been chosen to fit into God's divine plan. It was God's will to have this man go into the holy place on this particular day. You see, the incense there was kept burning 24-7. And so what would happen as they divided up into groups and, and the service began, the, the priest that was chosen by Lot went into the holy place and he took the ashes off the altar and he dumped those out. And then we go and take the golden altar that had been filled with burning coals from the offering and he would set those before the Lord. And he would go and get the basket that contained the incense that was specially made just for this time. And he would begin to sprinkle that over those hot coals. And while that smoke and aroma ascended up into the temple there before the holy place, he offered an intercessory prayer for the people. It's inspiring to know, beloved, that this gospel opens with people praying outside the temple. And Luke will close it with people praising God outside this very temple. In the intervening chapters, we have how that prayer was answered in the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so with the priest and the people engaged in prayers, it was an appropriate time for a divine revelation, for, for God to send his messenger angel right there to the right side of the altar, a place of favor to talk to this man. And Zechariah was standing there, spreading out the incense, and, and I can picture him there. He spreads out the infants, the, the smoke begins to rise, his, his arms are probably raised in the air, his eyes are closed. He begins to open up his heart to God and praise God and just talk to God like, like you and I would. God, it's been a long time. There's so much going on in our world today. I don't even know where to begin. 
God, can you speak to us? You promised us a Savior. You promised to redeem us. And as he opens his eyes, there before him is the angel. Standing on the right side. He's never seen an angel before. None of his contemporaries have seen an angel before. And so it startles him. The angel says, Zachariah, don't, don't be afraid. The prayer you just prayed has been answered. It's going to be answered partly through you. Your wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a son, and you're going to call him John. <laughs> Wait a minute. How's this going to happen? You see, John means that God is gracious. We have gracious God, don't we? We, we deserve far worse than what we get. Romans chapter 3 tells us that we all fall short of God's glory, that none of us search out for God, that we deserve so much worse off. And yet God in his loving faithfulness, he sends light instead. He sends his grace instead of his fury. It's his grace that we so desperately need. If not for the grace of God, we would be in far much worse situation. And so the angel tells Zacharias that, that this baby will be a joy and a delight to him. And, and that many people around him will rejoice because of John's birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or fermented drink. He's spilling out a Nazarite vow here. So this promise that, that God is saying is, is the promise that God had made through Malachi. It's being fulfilled this is what God had said. This is, this is God's word unfolding before his very eyes. It's what he's been waiting for. This is their hope. John is going to pave the way for the Messiah. For the answer to their prayers. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Chosen by God, anointed to preach repentance. Beloved, that's exactly what we've been called to do. Except here is to prepare the way for the kingdom of God and the Christ. And when John preaches these words, as we know, as it goes out into the wilderness, it's a, it's a word of reconciliation. You see, John is a peacemaker. John is making peace between the Father and his children. Creator and his created. And repentance, then, is the mode of his sermons. A return to, to trust in God to turn away from sin and, and be directed to the Lamb, the one that God will send. It tells us here that, that John would be great in the sight of the Lord, which is the only kind of greatness below that even matters in this world today. For all his greatness, though, Jesus said that you, his followers, would be even greater. Matthew chapter 11, among those Born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Though John is great, great, he who is least in the kingdom will actually be greater than he. You see, John's going to have this special anointing on him to serve and to praise God, much like the prophet Elijah. He's going to be uncompromising in his faith. And his main focus is going to be lead people to be reconciled through God's word. And many people will turn back to God. They're turning to the Christ. Notice how Luke implies that, that Jesus is coming. There's a deity here. Verse 16 and 17 it says that John would turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And then in 17 he says, John would go before him. Now who is the him that John is talking about? Obviously we understand he's talking about God. He's, he's talking about Jesus. Because we know that God the Father did not come down here and walk on the earth. No, it was God the Son that came. John is going to be the forerunner of Jesus. And so in the opening paragraph of Luke's gospel, he is implying that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the one that John will pave the way for, who will redeem mankind. Jesus is the one that you have to trust in, that you have to believe in. Now I understand much like Zechariah, placed in this very same situation, we might find this hard to believe. 
right? That's exactly what Zechariah thinks. How, how, Lord, how is this even possible? Well, first off, we're way too old to be the parents of any child. And God, why me? Why us? Why, why now? Even though he prayed the prayer and he knew the promise, he still questions the power of God to do what God said that he would do. Had he forgotten that the God of Abraham sent Isaac? Had he forgotten that this God is a miracle worker? That God is not contained by our simple physical limitations? That this is the God who opened the sea and closed the mouth of lions? Was he not capable of opening up a barren womb? Let me ask you something, beloved. How strong is your faith? How big is your God? Because the God of the Bible can do anything that he deems right. This word says the faith of the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. So if, you, if it says that that much faith, that least amount can do that, and you say to that mountain, move, it will move. Because God can do that. But for his doubt, he's made unable to speak. And maybe not even hear, as Luke later suggests, until the baby is born. And you might think, well, Pastor, that's pretty harsh. Why would God do such a thing to this, this man? Well, there's a strong theological principle here. Because unbelief has nothing to do that's worthwhile. Our unbelief keeps us from the truth. Unbelief hinders you from having blessing and joy. And so Jack Zachariah is cut off from joy. From sharing his joy with others. From verbalizing the feelings that he has and speaking to anyone because he does not believe what God said. How many people are out there that are cut off from the blessings of God? Because they fail to believe. They fail to believe that Jesus is the Christ. How many people are cut off from the blessing of God because they fail to believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved? You see, unbelief steals not only our joy and our blessing, but it takes away your testimony. It holds you back, beloved. Until such time that faith comes in and, and bursts forth in praise. So don't miss out on what God is making available today. Do not doubt that He wants to save your soul. That, that He has something big planned for you. Because the scripture says that outside of Christ, we can do nothing to please God. And so it's imperative that we trust him. As these people are waiting impatiently outside, they're beginning to wonder, what's taking Zachariah so long? You see, normally the priest would, would go in and come out as fast as he possibly could so that he didn't accidentally do something that's going to offend God. So they're waiting and they're waiting. When he finally comes out, he can't say anything. He can't communicate to them. He's just making signs and gestures. He couldn't even pass on the customary blessing that we read about in the book of Numbers. So they just assume that he, he saw something in there. He's, something's happened. And it tells us here when his time of service was completed, he returned home. You see, the priest would serve so long at the temple, and then they take an, ascend, an extended sabbatical. It's assumed from this time that, that Zechariah would have served however much time that is in total silence. Until such time he's allowed to go home. And there back in Judea with his wife, Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And for five months, she remains in seclusion. And again, we, we, we look at this picture, and, and why on earth you think about a baby? Most folks, from the time that 
They find out that there's going to be a child. We have a beautiful baby boy down here in the front, front pew. And, and the moment you find out that there's a child coming into your life, you want to tell everybody and anybody. But for five months, nothing. Because this is just like a Christmas gift. It's hidden away. It's placed somewhere out of the eyes. So that when it finally does come out and it begins to open up, it's a surprise. And there's joy. They're about to be part of the greatest gift ever given. John is going to lay out the pathway for Jesus Christ. It tells us here that he's going to soften hearts. That he's going to, to get the people's hearts ready so that when God speaks truth, they're open to it. Love this word that we're reading here through the writer Luke is God's word. As we study through it, its intention is to soften your heart. To make you malleable so that you can then receive the gift that God wishes to give you, his truth. As John will later write, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish. And so the question today, as we study about Zechariah, is do you believe? We have to answer that first. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that God so loved you that he sent Jesus into this world just for you? Because the answer to that question is yes, he did. Because as Peter so rightly says, God does not wish for any of his creation to perish, but all to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we're going to sing this invitation if there's anybody here that wants to accept Jesus as their Savior. If you believe that Jesus is your Savior, we need to make that a public profession. We need to tell the world because that is the greatest thing in the world. Amen. Becoming part of the family. You're part of the church now. So as we sing, I'll ask my prayer team if they'll come forward. Him an invitation, Brother Paul's going to lead us. Let's sing. Let's sing. To trust, to obey, to believe, that's how to be happy as a Christian in this world.